Good morning, everyone. My name is Holly Ruser, and I'm a National Product Manager with Graybar. I'd like to welcome you today to Graybar's G2 Talk presentation on how HD Base T, the emerging technology that will change the future of video and audio. This talk is a part of our webinar series we offer each month for our data communication customers. We have a great discussion lined up for you today. Before we get started, we'd like to cover just a few housekeeping items. First of all, if you are one of the first 50 people who joined in on this presentation, you will receive a coupon for a free cup of coffee from a national coffee chain courtesy of Graybar as a thank you for your time today. Also, if you notice at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a box for questions and answers. Feel free to submit questions throughout the presentation. We'll address just as many questions as time permits at the end of the presentation. Lastly, our G2 Talks are all archived on the graybar.com website, so you'll be able to view this presentation again or recommend it to others. We're happy to team up today with Legrand as a data communications distributor, Graybar works alongside Legrand to provide the latest in audio and video technology to help prepare you for the future. You can visit graybar.com to learn more about our solutions. At this time, I'm happy to introduce today's speaker, Joe Cornwall. Joe describes himself as a technology evangelist for Legrand. He's a very dynamic presenter, award-winning author, and widely recognized industry trainer. Joe has worked in the commercial AV industry for well over two decades, and has held both management and technical positions. Joe is a faculty member of Infocom and was named Infocom Educator of the Year in 2014. He's a frequent presenter at Bixi, AIA, and other industry events. Joe is also a graduate of the University of Cincinnati and holds multiple industry certifications. So without further delay, I would like to turn the presentation over to Joe. Take it away, Joe. Thank you very much, and thank you, everyone, for taking time out of your busy day to join us on this presentation. We're going to have a lot of fun talking today about digital video technology. Specifically, we're going to talk about HD base T and digital video at length. How do we extend these digital video signals out to 100 meters, and in many instances, even beyond 100 meters. Well, we're going to talk about quite a bit of this, and there's a whole lot that's going to be involved with this. So buckle your seatbelts. Make sure you have a fresh, warm cup of coffee. Let's dive right in and see what we're going to be up against today. We're going to start by talking about digital video and defining exactly what digital means. Now, I know that's not really talking about the technology of HD based T or digital video, but it's so important that we understand the signals that we're dealing with so that way we can make good decisions when it comes time to uh, determine what products we want to install or how we have to troubleshoot a system. So we're going to talk about what makes a system digital. We'll talk about sampling. We'll talk about bit depth. We'll talk about the expectations of connectivity distance and the payload that we have to deal with inside of the system. We're going to talk about the technical challenges of long connections. Just because we're in a digital world doesn't mean that we don't have the same kind of concerns that we had with analog television in terms of noise and signal loss and other things. We'll talk about those as they relate to digital video. Then we'll dissect and review the components of digital video necessary for system utility. If we think about this, what is the payload? If we're saying video, we actually need so much more than video. The trick is to make sure that we understand that when we're doing a system layout and a design and selecting products to fit a particular application. And finally, once we have that basic understanding of the science and the vocabulary of digital video out of the way, we'll actually review some of the digital video connectivity options and compare and contrast the ways that you can send high definition signals throughout any enterprise or residential installation. So taking a look at this, the last 100 meters. I love this quote from Clifford Stoll. I sense an insatiable demand for connectivity. And the reality is that is exactly what our market is delivering to us right now. We have more and more requirements to be able to connect more and more devices over unspecified distances. And we're trying to unify, unify that by making sure that we use the same kind of cabling, both for network and audio video technology. That would truly make our lives a little bit easier. So let's take a look at what's happening inside of the cable. You know, one of the things that's so important, and I do this training all over the country, indeed all around the world, 
And I always ask the question of my audiences when I start, if I have an HDMI connection between, for instance, a Blu-ray player and a TV, is the signal flowing through that HDMI wire analog or digital? Well, it's kind of a trick question because there's no way for ones and zeros to actually go through a piece of wire. All signals, even digital signals, utilize analog waveforms. And analog is very unique. Analog is actually continuous in nature and has essentially infinite bandwidth. That's right, analog has infinite bandwidth. I'll give you an example. In your imagination, go back to the days of records, vinyl records. We had surround sound. How did we do surround sound on vinyl records? How did we get those extra channels? Well, we actually had more bandwidth in analog, and we multiplexed the rear channels up to a higher frequency, and then simply sent them through some electronics to reverse that process to get the earlier versions of CD4 and other surround sound. When we move from the analog environment to the digital environment, we sacrifice this infinite bandwidth for what is in essence an infinite noise floor. So digital requires that we use very specific um, parameters in order for this to be able to work. The signal that's going through wire that is representing the digital content of the program is, in essence, a square wave. And if you look at your screen, you'll see a sine wave at the very top of your screen, or below that is a square wave. Now, I want you to imagine that that sine wave is 1,000 hertz, 1,000 times per second. Of course, it's much, much faster than that. In the case of digital video, digital video it's about 74 megahertz. But for a 1,000 hertz sine wave, in order to make that a square wave so that the detectors inside of the electronic gear can tell a 1 from a 0, we take the fundamental sine wave and we start adding its odd harmonics. Odd harmonics are that fundamental number times all of the odd numbers. So a sine wave at 1 kilohertz plus a sine wave at 3 kilohertz in a slightly uh, lower volume or, or lower level, and 5 kilohertz, a little lower than that, 7 and 9 and 11 and 13, 15, 17, 19, 21, all the way out to infinity. That's what makes that square wave. You can all of a sudden see that that simple 1 kilohertz wave is laden with incredible high frequencies. And of course, high frequencies are the most challenging things for us to move from point to point. They're finicky, they don't like obstacles, and they're easily contaminated. In the analog world, we have to worry about nonlinearities. And anything that affects this digital square wave, representing the digital payload that changes it, maybe adding noise or distortion, is in essence, ignored by the detector until it gets so big that the detector can't tell the difference between a 1 and a 0. At that point, digital fails. So the nice thing about analog is we always had a signal. The wonderful thing about digital is we have a perfect signal. We never lose quality right up until we don't have a signal at all. We call that the digital cliff. Now, as we move forward, one of the advantages of digital signals is it uses these discrete representations. I want you to imagine a waveform, for instance, a musical waveform, and what we do is we sample it. We take a picture of it at certain periods of time. We call that the sampling frequency. And if you think about a compact disc, the sampling rate of a compact disc is 44,100 times a second. Now, that frequency defines the upper frequency of the entire system. In video, we're talking about several multiples now. Once again, 74 megahertz for digital video. At each one of these samples, we are describing it with a digital word. That digital word uses bit depth to tell us how loud the signal is. That's the only thing that a digital signal can do is tell you how fast the frequency is changing, the frequency bandwidth, and how loud it is, the amplitude. And with those two parameters, an X and a Y component on a graph, if you will, we can create everything of digital video and digital audio and even the data content that flows through networks. Let's take a look at that concept of digital uh, detection. Digital connections leverage analog signals. And as you can see at the very top, you see a, a, a form of a sine wave. And in the center of that sine wave, you see a slight blue dot. Well, that is the eye pattern of what a digital signal, an analog signal representing a digital payload, would look like in the wire. The voltage goes high, the detector says that's a 1. The voltage goes low, 
that's the detector says that's a zero. Now I want you to look at how those traces are overlapping, and there's a little bit of thickness. That thickness tells me that the start and stop time of the waveform is changing in time. We call that jitter. All systems have jitter because we're running analog signals through our wire, whether that's a Category 5, a Category 6, a Category 6A. It's just endemic to the beast. So the jitter is part of the parameter. It usually does not cause a problem. But if jitter gets out of control and pinches on that blue pupil on the eye and pinches on the eye pattern, then the detector doesn't know it's a, a 1 from a 0. If that's the case, we lose the data. And unlike in a network, there's no checksum. There's no ability to send another packet, and therefore we've lost the video content. How do you troubleshoot this? If you're looking at a screen and you see little flashes of green light, little pixels that are on and off, those little flashes are where the detector could not tell a one from a zero, and it lost all of its information. So these digital signals in, cab in cables, they are leveraging analog waveforms, and they are somewhat susceptible to noise. The other thing we have to keep in mind is there's typically a clock signal used to synchronize these digital circuits in audio and video. Unlike the packetized nature of the network, video and audio signals require tight clocking because this is how, I mean, just imagine the sound of rock and roll music. There is a beat to it. Video and audio have to live to the rhythm of these signals, and that is the clock signal. We call that a synchronous signal as opposed to the asynchronous signal that we see inside of network connections. It's important when we think about running digital video over longer lengths that we don't lose our place when we're thinking about the physics of wire. 150 years ago, George Simon Ohm postulated Ohm's law. And this is an empirical law, which means it had to be observed. Ohm's law has since been tested in the laboratory and holds true on circuits all the way down to a scale of circuits just a few atoms thick. So this is a global empirical law. And a couple of things that we can surmise from this relationship of voltage, current, and resistance, a formula that we should all know by heart, is that if we are going a longer distance particularly over copper, then we're going to have a greater resistance. We're going to have a greater voltage drop over that copper. In order to overcome that, we typically have to increase the cross-sectional areas of the wire. We need more copper. So if I'm going to be con connecting, for instance, a Blu-ray player, and I'll use a Blu-ray player and a TV as an example. Understand that I could be used just as easily be talking about a, uh, a computer and a projector or an interactive whiteboard, but we'll just use a Blu-ray player and TV is our parlance to, to set into that. So if I'm going a longer distance to connect my Blu-ray player to my TV, I need to have a thicker wire. At some point in time, that wire gets so thick, so unwieldy, and there's so much copper inside it, it becomes so expensive that it really becomes impractical to wire it any longer. In reality, when we talk about HDMI connections, that length limitation is somewhere between 15 and 20 meters. I don't think anybody who's been in this industry would ever consider running an HDMI cable without some kind of electronic buffer on both ends more than about 60 feet, about 20 meters. And I would feel safer in my designs if I didn't do that on anything more than 45 feet, about 15 meters. Now, if we have resistance in this cable, that generally affects all frequencies at the same time, according to Ohm's law. And we have to understand that there are two other elements into a cable construction, capacitance and inductance. Capacitance acts like a treble control on your stereo, turning down the high frequencies, whereas inductance acts like the bass control on a stereo system, turning down the low frequencies. These two elements, capacitance and inductance, come into play when we're dealing with an alternating signal. And of course, a digital video representation, the analog signal, the square wave, is alternating. It's going from ones to zeros. So in order to do this, we now have to start thinking about things like characteristic impedance. All cables operating in analog, or excuse me, in an AC circuit, in an alternating circuit, exhibit a characteristic impedance. As an example, perhaps you've installed an antenna system and to install that antenna system when you were doing that installation, you utilized an RG6 cable. You may refer to an RG6 cable as a 
75 ohm cable. That 75 ohms is actually referring to the characteristic impedance of the cable. Now, you can't take a volt ohm meter and measure 75 ohms from the center conductor to the shield, nor could you take a volt ohm meter and measure 75 ohms from one end of the cable to the other. It is almost an imaginary construct that occurs, and it is set not by any specific electronic property of the cable or the circuit, but believe it or not, it is set by the shape of the cable itself. In the case of that RG6 coaxial cable that we're using for an antenna, the, co the 75 ohm characteristic impedance is set by the ratio of the center conductor to the dielectric, the insulation, around the center conductor. And as long as that is round and has the right proportions, it is a 75 ohm cable. If, for example, though, you strip that cable and you put the wrong connector on it or you use the wrong crimping tool and you change its shape from round to ovoid or perhaps it gets run over by a fork truck or perhaps it gets kinked or perhaps you um, utilize a tie wrap when you're putting this in place and you change the shape, you've changed the characteristic impedance. And to these high-frequency signals going through the wire, that change in characteristic impedance looks like a partially silvered mirror. So some of the signal goes through and you get it at the far end of the uh, transmission. Some of it is reflected back to the beginning where it mixes with the new signal entering the link and causes destructive phase anomalies. This can be a source of that flashing on the screen where we lose pixels. So the characteristic impedance is important and there is a characteristic impedance also to category cables. In fact, one of the uh, comments I like to make when I do this presentation live is the easiest way to turn a Cat5 into a Cat3 is to put a whole bunch of tie wraps around it and to bend it around a very tight radius. You'll quickly find out that you've changed the shape of that cable, changed the characteristic impedance, and changed its ability to be able to send these signals. There's another thing we have to worry about, specifically in digital video. It's also part of our network topology, but we often don't talk about it. It's a much bigger issue when we look at broadcast, and that is something called skin effect. You know, years ago, a specific cable manufacturer operating in the residential market came up with the idea that they would make speaker wires that had big, thick wire for base and slightly thinner wire for the mid-range and thinner wire for the treble, the idea being that the electrons would find their own way into the cable. That was truly a wonderful fantasy story because the way it actually works is as frequencies get higher, they tend to push out by something called counter EMF or counter electromotive force to the point where they're riding only on the outer edge of the cable. In the RF industry, where we're dealing with things like broadcast radio or broadcast television, we can actually use copper-plated steel coaxial cables because the signal was never intended to flow through the steel center of the conductor, but only through the copper cladding on the outside. And if you've ever been into a true broadcast environment, perhaps you've seen the antenna at a TV station or a radio station, then you'll recognize that there is no wire going from the broadcast amplifier to that antenna it's a waveguide, which looks more like a pipe than an actual solid piece of copper. Why is this uh, important? Because as we deal with digital video, and it's very, very high frequencies, once again, over 74 megahertz for 1920 by 1080 or 1080p signal, we find that the signal really does travel only along the outer edge of the cable. And this means that when we're putting in wiring specifically for HD base T, but in essence, for any digital video application, we want to make sure that we're using a solid core cable, and we're not even using stranded patches in and out of it. We should maintain solid core. Uh, we should maintain solid core integrity from the beginning to the end of the link in question. We've talked a little bit about the electrical characteristics. We've talked about the sampling and the bit depth, which basically describes how loud the signal can be. And we'll get into a little bit more information as we go about that. Let's take a look at the digital payload. Let's parse that. Let's get into a little bit more information and find out what is really inside of this electrical pipeline that we call the transmission uh, pipeline, the, the, the HDMI cable or the category cable that we're using. First and foremost, let's understand how video works. All video that you've seen, regardless of when, from the earliest transmissions in 1953 when we first added color, all video systems work the same way. It is an additive color system. We use the elements red, 
green, and blue. And when shined in an appropriate proportion, about 65% green, about 20% red, about 15% blue, they will make up white. And we actually define the white color space very specifically as something called D6500. We don't have to really get into too much information about that, but there's an entire category of technological um, configuration, basically installation, to align these things. That's part of the ISF uh, organization, the Imaging Science Foundation. So we have red, green, and blue. This is an additive color model, and every system utilizes that. And in the RGB system, the sampling frequency is proportional to the amount of detail we'll see, and the bit depth, or the word depth, is proportional to how loud the red or green or blue is. Interestingly, our eyes see color in a very unique way. And this is important. Allow me to explain chroma subsampling. This is a bit of a complex concept, but it's very important, and I promise I'll draw this back so that it makes a little, a little bit more sense for you. When we look at chroma subsampling, if we look at something as we evolved as a species, our eyes did not see, need to see as much detail in colors we did in black and white. Basically, we see a whole lot more in black and white. And in fact, our existing broadcast television system, if you're watching a 1920 by 1080 Blu-ray player, you are seeing half as much information in color as you are in white. Computers are very stupid devices. They only do one thing. They do addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. They just do mathematical transitions, but they do them at incredibly fast speeds. So computers output video in a format known as 4, 4, 4. This is not an aspect ratio. This is a chroma subsampling ratio. What it is saying to me is that I have equal amounts of red, green, and blue. The bandwidth of each is the same. And in fact, the sampling rate is 8 bits. 8 bits means 2 to the 8th power. This gives me 256 levels of green, 256 levels of blue, 256 levels of red. And if I multiply them together, 256 times 256 times 256, I come up with the astonishing number of about 16.778 million colors. That's the true color system of video today. But when you're watching a Blu-ray player, or you're watching cable television or satellite television, or you're looking at video you shot on your phone, that is actually recorded chroma subsampled. In a chroma subsampling system, we utilize a black and white signal called LUMA, and we take Luma minus red and Luma minus blue. We call that YPRPB, and it gives us a lot less bandwidth. If you look at the ratios, 444 is a computer. That's pure RGB. 422 is a YPRPB signal, and it saves us about a third of our bandwidth. Simple addition will tell you what the chroma subsampling is doing. 4 plus 4 plus 4 is 12. 4 plus 2 plus 2 is 8, it's 33% less, we're saving about a third of our bandwidth. DVD players, your cell phone, broadcast, they're actually encrypted in 420. 4 plus 2 plus 0 equals 6, it's half the bandwidth of a computer. Why is this important? Because if you're installing a system, for instance, in a college classroom, or uh, a place like a, a boardroom where we might have different kinds of solutions that are going to be in there, it's important to talk to our clients. Well, what are you going to be watching? If we can put in a Blu-ray player and we can see a 1080p image on that TV, that's fine and dandy, right up until the professor shows up with her laptop computer or perhaps has been taking images using a digital SLR and art history class, and you realize that in the same 1920, the same 1080p image, is going to be in pure RGB, it is a 35% bandwidth penalty. It's a bigger signal, even though superficially it looks like the same specs. This slide gives us a slightly better look at it. I'm not going to spend a lot of time because honestly there's nothing that you can do to change the chroma subsampling, but we should understand 444 or full bandwidth RGB is the way computers speak. And computers do this because they are linear and they can't do chroma subsampling. All of the other devices, regardless of where they are, whether they're a Blu-ray player or a DVD player, whether it's a streaming player, a conferencing codec, or any other device, is generally operating in a 420 or 422 mode, substantially lower bandwidth. And you already know that any signal with a lower bandwidth is easier to transport. The challenge for us 
is to make sure that when we're transporting a signal in any installation, that we've accounted not just for 1920 by 1080, but that we've talked to our client and we're accounting for 1920 by 1080 with whatever input device they might have. Now, we can't talk about digital video without also talking about digital audio. You took an HDMI cable and you cut it open and started looking inside, you would find that there are 19 conductors. None of them are carrying digital audio. Sean, Sean, or Claude Shannon was a scientist working in post-World War II America who wrote a book in 1949 called On Information Theory. And he postulated ultimately, and this is my way of interpreting it, that bits are fungible, that to a processing unit, it doesn't matter what a one or a zero means, it is simply a mathematical addition or subtraction for that processor to do with blindingly fast speeds. So there is no difference to the processor between digital audio and digital video. And harken back to what I said about RGB. Green is about 65% of, uh, uh, of the load. Uh, red is about 20, or blue is about 20%, red is about 15%. Might have those last two flip back and forth, but that's, that, that's neither here nor there. But regardless, we have plenty of room inside of those blue and red guns to be able to tuck in some digital audio, as well as a lot of other overhead and housekeeping things, such as closed captioning and other things that might happen to be inside of this digital signal. So digital audio is carried as part of the digital video signal in an area called the horizontal ancillary channel. So there is no particular pair. So when we're talking about transporting a digital video signal, we have to think in terms of digital video, we also have to think in terms of digital audio, we also have to think in terms of digital rights protection. This is a very, very important concept. Digital rights protection is done in video and in broadcast through a technique called high bandwidth digital content protection, referred to as HDCP. This is a key authentication and exchange format used in cryptography based on something called the LOM scheme. Mathematically, it is very, very challenging to explain, but it's actually pretty uh, easy. There are keys inside of a device. Let's say your cell phone may have four keys, your Blu-ray player may have 12 keys. The number of keys just really is kind of random based on what the manufacturer wanted to put in there. The keys are very expensive, these 56-bit long digital keys. And they use these keys and they heterodyne them with a key selection vector, a public key, to come up with an impossibly long number. That impossibly long number should match the impossibly long number, for instance, on a TV. The Blu-ray player and the TV will have the same number, and if they do, then they can be able to speak. If they don't, then the system will automatically be cut off, and you'll get a sign that'll say, this content requires HDCP for playback. This HDCP can be initiated in one of two ways. It can either be based on the content itself, so for instance, I could put HDCP on a PowerPoint deck if I didn't want anybody to be able to copy it. More and more often, manufacturers are putting HDCP into a device, and a really good example are Apple computers. They require full HDCP environments to operate, so we can't just strip away HDCP, we must have HDCP. So when we start talking about how do I carry digital video, 20 meters and beyond, it's not now, as you see, just video. It's video, it's audio, and it's also digital rights management and HDCP that must be there. But you know, even that's not enough. If I'm sending digital video 20 meters or more, it, bears in, it, it seems to bear in mind that I'm not going to get up out of my chair and go running across the room every time I need to turn systems on or be able to change things about them. We must also consider when we're running digital video at these lengths that we must be able to run some kind of system control. There are a number of control systems that are utilized. RS-232, recommended standard 232, has been around since the 1960s. It is a low baud rate system that is very effective at control. There's an embedded control feature in part of the HDMI standard called CEC, Consumer Electronic Control. This particular standard allowed us to take, for instance, a Blu-ray player and put a disc in the drawer and hit play. And it would then turn on your audio video receiver, go to the correct input, turn on the TV, go to the correct input, select the right surround mode and the, and the right aspect ratios. CEC is an automated control feature. It's not often used in commercial applications. It's quite often used in consumer applications. However, co 
commercial displays do have CEC. It's just configured as default off out of the box. Of course, consumer displays that have it is configured as default on box. Other ways that we can have system control would include infrared remote controls and hexadecimal codes, and we can either flash them at the end and back into a light format, infrared, or in some instances, some, some devices allow us to take IR via 3.5 millimeter plug directly into the device. Regardless, this is a form of system control that we should be aware of. And finally, the most important form of control, the form of control for the 21st century really is USB. If interactive is part of it, USB is there. And we have to make sure that we have USB as part of our designs. So now we've talked about these things that we have to have. We also have to have EDID. All of these things are out there. EDID, extended does display identification data, allows the TV to tell the Blu-ray player or the computer precisely what resolutions it's capable of. So this is also part of the digital payload that we're sending. Now let's take our newfound knowledge of these and take a look at a few connection types and see how can we actually extend digital video. Well, it's not that we have to use twisted pair. There's a number of ways we can do this. We can actually extend digital video quite a distance over coaxial cables. As an example, your cable company is doing it right now. They're probably delivering 125 channels of high-definition video to your home, along with very fast Ethernet. Indeed, we can do this in most commercial applications. We can extend HDMI over coax in a number of different ways. But we're going to kind of focus on HD-based heat today. You can also extend digital video over optical fiber. Oftentimes in the broadcast industry, we're extending this over single-mode fiber to go very long distances. In premise installations, or if we're using fiber, we typically use OM4 in the AV world. But the real key is can we use this fellow right here, twisted pair. Category cable is ideally optimized for HD, base T, and other digital video solutions. You know, in the networking world, we call the solutions that are using twisted pair, perhaps 10 base T, 100 base T, 1 gig base T. But have you ever asked yourself, what does this base T really mean? What is that moniker all about? Well, it's pretty easy to understand. Base T simply refers to baseband. And if we look at a system, a baseband system is a system that starts at the lowest frequencies, not quite zero, but somewhere above zero, and extend all the way up to the highest frequency the system requires. In the case of digital video, 74.25 megahertz. Now you know why you can carry digital video over a Category 5 cable rated at 100 megahertz. It seems as though the signals would be quite compatible, and indeed they are. Of course, the opposite of a baseband signal would be a passband signal. And another word for a passband signal is radio broadcast. That would be passband where we're actually modulating a signal. We'll get back to that in a few moments. Let's take our knowledge about the digital payload, whether it's chroma subsampled, whether it's RGB, with the fact that we need audio, the fact that we need needed information, the fact that we need uh, HDCP information, all of these things. Let's apply them to some practical applications and see if we can figure out how HD based T operates and what alternatives there are to HD based T, life beyond 20 meters. Well, there's one technique that you'll see. This is pretty common, actually, in house of worship type applications, but also in commercial applications, never in residential applications. It's called serial digital interface, and it's been with us for a few years. This is a technique of extending digital video over a serial connection, a single pathway connection. In this case, we use an RG6 with a BNC. And this at 3G SDI, and 3G here stands for 3 gigabits per second, would give us the ability to do 1920 by 1080, the high definition that we're dealing with now. However, there are additional standards. 6G SDI is designed to support the new emerging 4K video standard, Ultra HD, or um, 3840 by 2160. 4K can also mean 4096 by 2160 at 30 frames. 12 gigahertz or 12 gig SDI would they extend that to 4K 60, and 24 gig SDI would extend that to 8K 60. That is an experimental format. Because SDI really does not, so it does not support in any way, shape, or form the HDCP, the Digital Rights Management, it is illegal. The Digital Millennium Copyright Act of 
1996, passed by Congress, says even if there is no infringement of copyright, even if you don't intend to copy something that shouldn't be copied, the fact that you put in a device that would allow HDCP to be stripped away is in fact against the law. And therefore, SDI cannot be used in residential environments, nor should it be used in commercial environments like conference rooms, huddle spaces, or collaboration spaces where we're not going to be doing live video support or production um, type materials. That means that we're going to be dealing with a different kind of signal. We're going to be dealing with a signal that has HDCP embedded. Now, as you go and uh, break into your search for the products that will work, you may come across a couple of choices. There are two ways that we can get digital video to go over a category cable. The first I refer to as a TMDS push. If we look inside of an HDMI cable, we quickly realize that there is red, green, and blue, each carried on its own shielded twisted pair. And then the sync signal is also carried on a shielded twisted pair, RGB and clock or RGBS. Well, no surprise, a category cable has four twisted pair. So it wouldn't be all that difficult for me to take R, G, B, and S and send it over a category cable. That's all I have to do is make some electro, electronic modifications to take into account the characteristic impedance and the voltage and a little bit of equalization. This TMDS push doesn't make any fundamental changes to the signal. Therefore, it is inexpensive. It can usually be identified by the requirement to have two category cables between the receive and transmit dongles. However, some manufacturers have brought this down to a single category cable by multiplexing the DDC and EDID information in the same way that we multiplexed those rear channels of a surround sound LP all the way back in the 1970s. The advantage to a system like this, it's inexpensive. We're talking about just a, a $100 or $200 to be able to buy the right kind of, uh, of solution. And it will support up to 1080p, but the disadvantage, we don't know over what distance. In this kind of technology, the carriage, carriage distance is inversely proportional to the signal bandwidth. So I could put this in, and it might work beautifully at 720, but it's not going to work at the same distance at 1080. Now, I want to bring your attention back to our discussion on chroma subsampling. If we put a system like this into a school, we may end up with an inexpensive extension for HDMI to go to that projector, but it's even more important that we have that conversation with the professor because if she comes in and utilizes her computer and has high quality images or high quality video that is in true RGB, we have a 30% bandwidth penalty over the 420 bandwidth of a traditional Blu-ray player. So a Blu-ray would play fine in the classroom, but then the professor comes in and plugs your computer in to show her images or her video, and the system doesn't operate. You may think there's a problem wrong with the computer, but in reality, what we're doing is just adding much, much higher bandwidth. Because this system is inversely proportional to the signal bandwidth, just because it works at 1080p with a Blu-ray player at, for instance, 75 feet, means that it might only work with a computer operating at 444 RGB video to a distance of 45 feet. This is not a surprise that you want to get in the middle of a workday after. There is a better way for us to be able to transmit digital video over category cables. Indeed, it's the newest IEEE standard. It was granted stat, uh, standard status in February of this year. And because of this, manufacturers everywhere are investing heavily into the HD Base T format. HD Base T was established in 2010 by LG, Samsung, Sony Pictures, and Valence Semiconductor, and Legrand is also an HD Base T adopter. We have been supporting this technology since its very inception, and a whole plethora of HD Base T solutions are available to you through Graybar. We are working to create a global standard for advanced media distribution, and HD Base T 2.0 standards were finalized last year. We have not seen products on this HD Base T solution uh, on the newest one yet, but HD Base T has some spectacular capabilities. First and foremost, it really does emulate the kind of network architecture that we already have in place according with Pixie standards, running a category cable. We have up to 100 meters, and in the case of HD Base T, 
We can actually throw in a repeater every 100 meters, and it can support a daisy chain architecture with up to eight hops. I will advise you that I've never actually seen eight hops done in person, but if you have a project, in particular a private residence, where you need to run the signal from a Blu-ray player to a TV 800 meters or roughly a half a mile away, I'd surely like to see that house. Give me a call. We'd like to take a look at how that works. But this is a perfect solution, seriously, in schools and other locations for digital signage because we can go quite a distance and we can support a number of displays on a device like this. More importantly, HD Base T was designed for something called Five Play. As you recall, when we started this training, we talked about the digital payload and the fact that digital video doesn't mean just video. HD Base T LLC understood this. HD Base T is designed to transport digital video up to and including 4K. It also is designed to handle the embedded digital audio set, uh, signals up to eight channels of full bandwidth surround sound. HD Base T also has the ability to extend fast Ethernet up to 100 megabits per second. And while that's not enough to do streaming video, it's more than sufficient to connect a projector and to be able to pull the projector to make sure that we have good bulb life and that things are operating properly. HD Base T also supports control. It supports both infrared remote control and the embedded CEC control from HDMI. It also supports RS-232. And just to make sure that you get the message that this is one of the most powerful systems ever designed for digital video, it also supports USB 2.0. That's right, HD Base T does IR, CEC, RS-232, and USB. You don't have to pick which one. You can use all of them, and you can use them all simultaneously. Finally, HD Base T uses a technology very similar to PoE, they call it POH, and it will deliver up to 100 watts of low voltage, allowing it to actually power up to a 50-inch flat panel. And yes, that technology is available. You can actually buy a 50-inch flat panel that will be powered directly by an HD Base T transmitter. In a strange twist of fate, a TV without a power supply is a lot more expensive than a TV with a power supply, so I wouldn't start designing to that. But you also should know that many projector manufacturers, Barco, Christie, Epson are making both interactive whiteboards and interactive projectors, and these are outstanding for education or for a home environment that have an HD base T input. You can go to a projector and plug directly in an RJ45. Now, on those projectors, there's still an AC outlet to power up the bulb. But you just plug that RJ45, and you can use a Legrand HD base T transmitter at the front end. It being a standard, it means all of these things are compatible. This is actually a fascinating image that you're looking at. This is the eye pattern of an HD Base T image. And this is why we advise that when you're installing HD Base T solutions, that you seriously consider the use of a shielded cable. This eye pattern is very complex. And although we don't have inter-pair distortions or inter-pair uh, fext or next issues where the pairs are interfering with each other because of the nature of the PAM-16 modulation, we do have a great susceptibility to external noise, to alien crosstalk. And therefore, for runs more than 50 meters, or specifically when you're designing systems that should be scalable to Ultra HD, we highly recommend the use of a shielded Category 6 cable. You can also use non-continuous shield solutions, such as a non-continuous shield CAT 6A, and that will work very well. But we do need to have something that is extremely uh, robust as regards alien crosstalk. Finally, if we look at this, we could transfer some of our signals using video over IP. This allows us to send these signals over the LAN, and it superficially also looks like HD base T because they are indeed going over the same kind of twisted pair. But you know the problem that we have over the video over IP is that when I take the output of my Blu-ray player in my living room and go to my TV, I'm actually looking at about as much as 10.2 gigabits per second of information. I don't think that we can put 10 gigabits of information on too many networks and still have a good afternoon. There are quality of service issues, and they place significant demands upon the systems that we're doing there. So in conclusion, as we look at our discussion of HD Base T technologies and some of the related technologies that look like HD Base T, we have learned this. 
in digital video applications, we have to put a lot of thought into any run greater than about 15 meters in length. Digital video content is transmitted via analog carriers operating in a defined medium, whether that's a category cable or a, a coaxial cable. Digital video content isn't just video. It includes video, audio, digital rights management, control systems, display data channel information, and even power components. Although it would be nice if we could do everything over SDI and the single coaxial cable that it requires, SDI systems do not support HDCP, so we have to look at alternatives. HD Base T was designed to support 5Play and truly does allow us to have all of the things that we need to do a successful digital video installation, whether that's in the home or enterprise, whether it's in your living room or the collaboration space, a boardroom or a conference room. And with that, I'd like to open the floor to any questions we may have. Thank you, Joe. It was an excellent presentation. Um, at this time, we'd like to address some questions that have been submitted. We actually have quite a few. Uh, I'm going to start with the first one, and, and the question is uh, around HD base T. Is it actually outside of the regular IP network? Yes, HD base T. Thank you for that question. That's actually a very good question, and I sometimes forget to emphasize this because I do this so often every day. HD base T is a way of connecting digital video sources to displays, TVs, and projectors, and it does not run on the network. It doesn't touch the network switch. It utilizes the same kind of cabling, and it needs to be put in with the same kind of care and consideration and generally to the same level of standards, but at no point does HD base T touch the network unless we're using that ability for it to extend fast Ethernet, and then we're only using that simply as an extension of a drop. HD base T is its own point-to-point -point connectivity solution. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, the second question we have is, are there alien crosstalk issues with the combination of HD base T and data Ethernet cables being routed in the same cable tray or conduit? Do they need to be in separate pathways? Generally speaking, a best practice would be to run your data and your audio video requirements in separate pathways. However, this is not always possible, uh, not always practical, and really it's not absolutely necessary. Yes, the data cables can radiate enough information so that the alien crosstalk can cause a problem with HD base T. However, HD base T is probably not going to radiate anything that would cause a problem with your network. I would advise that if you're running HD base T cables in the same pathway with data cables, that you utilize a shielded category cable for the HD base T. And make sure if you're going to use that shielded CAT6 that you're also using shielded connections and shielded jacks and shielded jumpers. We have to maintain that shield from one end to the other. Okay. Um, Joe, one follow-up question that just came in uh, is, should HD base T only be ran on 6A or higher category cable? That is a very, very good question. And there's actually a couple of different answers from HD base T itself. So HD base T has two products that they make. They have HD base T Lite, which is designed to support up to 1920 by 1080, your traditional high definition video that you see in your home. And HD base T Lite has, doesn't have all of the feature sets. It doesn't do the extended ethernet. It doesn't do all the power. It doesn't do all of the various controls, although it does RS-232 and, and, and infrared. HD base T Lite can be run, according to HD base T, on CAT5. I personally wouldn't do that, but I think that it can be run successfully in a residential application on Category 5 cable. Full HD base T does require Category 6, and in any application where I'm designing a system that will scale to Ultra HD or 4K, uh, you have to use a Category 6, and it should be shielded in any commercial application. Think about the difference between commercial and a residential application just in the number of radios in the location. In your home, you have a couple of people with cell phones. In your office, you have dozens and dozens of cell phones and perhaps dozens and dozens of wireless access points. It is a much noisier environment, and shielded, shielding this cable becomes much more important in that regard. Okay. Uh, the next question, thank you, Joe, um, is 
Re regarding streaming video, would it not be compatible with HD base T at 100 meters? Streaming video is actually kind of challenging because here's what we're doing, okay? If we say that we want to stream video, yes, it's possible for me to stream video at 100 meters and get 1920 by 1080 at 60 frames. It's, it's possible to do 1080p. You probably watch it from YouTube or Amazon or things like that. So also notice that when you're watching high def on Amazon, it doesn't look as good as a Blu-ray player, and that's because of QoS or quality of service. We actually have to do some things to that signal to get it through, go through the wire. But more importantly than that, that, if I'm going to IP, let's say from my Blu-ray player to my flat panel TV 100 meters away, in order to take streaming video at that TV, the TV needs to have a computer built into it, doesn't it? It needs to have the ability to accept an IP signal and decompress it, because that is a compressed signal, perhaps running at 10 or, or 15 megabits per second. That means I have to have a smart TV that has more complexity, and that additional complexity makes it very difficult for me to put in control systems like Crestron or AMX systems, or even simpler systems like Zantac. And it adds expense to the TV. It also adds expense to programming the installation and setting it up. If I'm going to make point-to-point -point connectivity of uncompressed digital video, then it is almost impossible over the LAN because even a simple Blu-ray can occupy as much as 10 gigabits of space and never would occupy less than one gigabit of space. So we would swamp a network if we tried to do uncompressed video. We would have to compress it to put it over the network, and that means we have to decompress it at the far end, and that adds a level of complexity. Okay, great. Uh, we've got time for just a couple more questions. One question that came in uh, early on is please further explain why only solid core is preferred due to skin effect rather than stranded since flexibility is important in some physical applications due to the vibration and outdoor environments. Absolutely, and I can think of a number of them. So if I have a TV that's, for instance, uh, um, uh, on some kind of a mount where I'm going to swivel it, I would want to have a, a stranded cable. In reality, what you should do is come to an HD base T termination point and then use an HDMI cable between those two. The reason that we have to use solid core cable is because the very high frequencies above 70 megahertz utilized inside of the digital video systems will tend to move on the outside of the cable. If it is a stranded cable, we end up with um, something called strand jumping, where we actually end up with jitter introduced by the uneven surface of the cable itself. Now, this isn't going to be a problem if I use a stranded CAT6 cable that's, let's say, 20 meters to make a simple connection from the desktop or from a conference table in a conference room to a projector on the wall that's, you know, 45 or 50 feet away. But as we go longer and longer distances, that strand jumping, that, un, that rough surface of that stranded cable can actually begin to introduce jitter into this very delicate signal and can truncate the distance. So I, instead of getting 100 meters, I may only get 80 or 70 or 60 meters. So HD base T Alliance, the organization that created this standard and created this technology, has put in there the caveat that for uncompressed video, particularly if we intend to scale it to 4K, and we should be looking at 4K for future applications, that a solid core cable is important to get maximum performance at maximum length. Okay, thank you. The very last question we're going to take, it's, it's a, kind of a two-part question. Uh, I think it will move quickly. The first is, um, are there POH projectors available? And in the second part of the question, is does the National Electrical Code recognize HD base T cabling as class two or class three cable, uh, being the same as data ethernet cable? Okay, I'll take those in reverse order. The second part of that question, I don't know the answer to that, but it is an excellent question. Thank you, and I will research that, and I will get back to you with an answer, and perhaps we can post it some way uh, uh, as a question to this. But that is something that I should, uh, I should know, and I simply have not. As to the first part of it, are there projectors that are POH? Well, the good news and the bad news. The bad news first. No, there are no projectors now that are POH. There are a number of projectors that have a, uh, an HD base T input, but they still require an AC mains to power the bulb. The good news, the move in projector technology is towards the lampless projectors, projectors that are using an LED light source. 
LED light sources, much lower voltage, much brighter, much longer lifetimes. Ipso facto, it is only a matter of time. The demand is already there. The manufacturers are working on it. I am at the Infocom show right now in Florida, and we, this is the largest AV show in North America. I have been teaching since Saturday, so unfortunately I haven't gone on the floor, but I'm going to go on the floor because I'll bet manufacturers are introducing POH projectors on that floor right now, and I'll bet you'll see them next year. Great, Joe. Thank you so much. Um, at this point, we're out of time. Uh, I, would, I would tell you that we had a lot of great questions. Uh, we, we have a lot of questions here that we're not going to have time to answer, but um, just as a, a follow-up, a gray bar representative will follow up with you if you ask a question after the presentation to make sure that your question is answered. Um, and just as a reminder, uh, this presentation will be archived on the graybar.com website. So uh, if you want to go back and listen to that again uh, or, or share it with, with others, uh, please feel free to do that. Again, thank you for your time today. We hope you will join us again next month for Graybar's G2 Talk. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day.